What is going on, everybody? It is Mark Cardula, lead faculty and CEO here at Modern Pain Care, where we make you the complete clinician. Coming at you with a different episode today with a different partner on today's episode. One of our MPC teammates, uh, Zach Huff, has graciously or generously offered his time, I should say, um, to kind of chime in on a conversation that him, uh, myself, and Jared have been having for a bit on DPT education. Uh, Zach and I both are have our feet somewhat in different levels in uh, DPT education and of course, we have ideas and thoughts and, and you know, pontificated things of, you know, some of the challenges that DPT education is faced. Um, before we get into today's conversation, I'd like to have Zach, for those of you who haven't met Zach, uh, Zach, can you introduce yourself, kind of give folks an idea of your journey of where you are, where you, where you came from, where you are today, and kind of your role there at the uh, university you teach at? Yeah, yeah, happy to do it, Mark, and happy to be on with you today, man. Um, so, like Mark mentioned, I'm Zach Huff. I graduated from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in 2011, and from then on worked for a tribal clinic for about nine or so years. I started with the Cherokees out in eastern Oklahoma, went from staff PT to kind of supervising PT, opened the clinic with them, moved into another staff PT role with the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, stuck there for five years and ended up leading them with a, as a coordinator. So after that, kind of started getting my feet wet with the world of academia and education before I finally took on a core faculty role with Oklahoma City University. And that's kind of where I am now. Mostly leading their MSK track and a few other courses scattered throughout the curriculum. Nice, you've come come full circle back into the uh, academia kind of starting grounds for you. But that's that's a, a interesting journey. I know we've talked about your your time at the uh, Indian, Indian Health System, which, you know, has, is a, definitely brings unique challenges as far as unique cultures and different things. And maybe that's another topic for another podcast, because I think they're I've, having had the privilege of being out there at the Indian Health Services doing some mentoring and things. It's been a good eye-opening experience just to see how different cultures approach healthcare and all that stuff. But let's keep it on the uh, DPT education topic, of course. So, you know, some of the challenges we've spoke about is kind of our current approach to DPT education. And, and, and obviously there's limitations of what you can do with a human being in two and a half, three years, depending on the curricular design. Um, but, but where do you see some of the challenges of kind of the, the thought process, the end goal of what, you know, a, a PT program director looks at, you know, what are the metrics they look at for success from their program versus what are the metrics for success in the clinic, you know, and they don't always align as far as, um, you know, passing boards versus passing the gray N equals one uh, encounters that we're going to face regularly in clinical care. I'm just curious, kind of, if you can talk about a little bit about kind of the, the, your thoughts on, on our current approach and some of the challenges it brings to those students or, and new grads who are navigating into a, a profession that doesn't fit perfectly the multiple choices of board exams and black and whites of PowerPoint presentations and all that stuff that uh, DPT education that you and I have both been through as well, kind of maybe lacks the preparation for that N equals one. No, no, absolutely, Mark. Um, and that's a hard area to really talk about because we know to be accredited through CAPD, we have to jump through a lot of hoops. We have to leap a lot of hurdles. And some of those require we teach certain things, certain ways. And they'd like to see how often we graduate students, one, and then two, how often those students pass the board. So to a large degree, yes, we have to teach to the things that get people to pass the boards. Fortunately, uh, you know, a lot of the time that does reduce the large number of deaths and injuries that we incur as PTs. But kind of like you said, it, those other skills are sometimes left off. And fortunately, the program and now we do a lot with trying to get students to critically reason, to critically think, but we have to do that within the scope of here's how to answer a question when you have four options that you didn't have to generate. So balancing that has by far been one of the biggest challenges I've come across in the academic world is how do I get students to one, take their own history, take this data we know exists and can and often is outdated, apply it, but then take the new data and integrate that into your own schema and then apply it to a patient in that situation at that time. I mean, by far, it's been the biggest challenge I've come across. Yeah. Uh, you know, myself being a clinical instructor where I get to see students who come in and we're fortunate at Midwestern university, uh, we have a setup. I know there's some similar setups with you as far as um, some uh, faculty, you know, kind of university practice that's kind of attached to the program a little bit. I know we have a little different setups, but 
um, seeing that kind of interaction, that's my favorite place to teach is where the book becomes the person in front of you as far as how do you, you know, filter that to a unique individual and, and, and tailor yourself to that care. I would agree with you. I don't think we, it, it's tough because we have to ch hit certain checklist items to make sure we're covering the things that, as you nicely discussed, are things that hopefully help us not injure, maim, kill any humans out there who are seeking our care. Um, so you become a safe PT coming out of PT school, which is great. I think we need to be competent, safe practitioners who aren't going to go out there and, and create issues, but to become a good clinician, I, and I, this was something I probably couldn't hear when I was coming out of school. It's, it's, I don't think we're maybe there yet. Um, unless you're, maybe you've had some amazing clinical experiences and different things. And maybe we can talk about clinical rotations because those can be highly variable. But uh, if you do get with somebody who can really instill some of this clinical reasoning, critical thinking skills, like maybe gives you a little bit of a leg up as you enter the workforce, but you know, the, the clinical reasoning, critical thinking thing is, is, is such a tough thing. And I don't think there's the perfect answer. I wish there was, cause you know, obviously you and I'd be rolling with it and it'd be, you know, done and said, and we'd be, you know, graduating amazing critical thinkers and clinical reasoners that, um, you know, looking back, I don't think either of you and I can say that we probably came out of school that way, but you know, we see that based on our experience, man, it would be so much nicer for those folks to at least have some of the foundational concepts on board. Uh, I'm just curious your thoughts on, you know, what a student, and, and maybe it's a, somebody who's currently in DPT school, or maybe an early career professional, um, you know, what can they do to kind of level up uh, their things, maybe within their programs, or in a, maybe outside of the programs in their rotations or in their, in their workplace? So that's, I mean, like you said, Mark, that's, that's a hard nut to crack for a lot of reasons, but some of the things that I've seen, and this is, again, completely anecdotal, is looking at those students who are able to critically appraise their own experience up to that point. In fact, we've had several who have gone through PT who have been part of a PT clinic beforehand, and what I see is the students who come in having that prior knowledge, prior skill, lean on that prior knowledge and prior skill, and it's hard to break that chain of, well, let's talk about the why. So when you can start approaching and pull people away from the, here's what I do because it's what we've done, what I've seen, and actually have people question some of these things we're doing and why we're doing it, is a big leg up in clinical rotations to my, to my knowledge and kind of my standpoint is, can you ask those hard questions and can you do it in a way that contributes to both patient care, your own edification and progress as a clinician and also gives you a chance to have a really good discussion with your faculty or clinical mentor. Yeah, it, it is one of those tough things when you've seen, you know, and you worked in a clinic and, and a lot of us have developed some nice tight relationships with the people we've met, you know, maybe done some shadowing, done our observation hours leading up into DPT school. So there's this kind of real, like <clears throat> that, that clinicians placed on this pedestal. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be. I mean, obviously it's great that there's PTs out there that are offering their time to, to let somebody come in and shadow and, and get their observation hours in order to apply for PT school. But it, it, it becomes, and this is just that authority bias and this kind of where this person is, is put on this pedestal to where there's just lack of ability to critically appraise and as we should. And I think not only others practices, but more importantly, our own practices being willing to put it out there and say, Hey, I need to take perspective on this. What is the thinking and decision-making that goes into this? That's just the way we did it at the clinic. I observed that, or I tech that before I went into uh, DPT schools, because it's just hard. And, and it doesn't mean that those people aren't nice, amazing people. It's just, there's a lot of folks who maybe more or less use critical thinking and clinical reasoning and practice, and maybe kind of just do things habitually out of just maybe habit. And that's just the way we do it, which I think, and, and I've been there, I think probably you can say, you know, you've probably been there as well, Zach, as far as sometimes we fall into ruts of this is just the way we do it, but I, we can aspire to do something better. We can aspire to do something that truly tailors ourselves to the individual. Cause you know what, not everybody fits the way that we've always done it. And I think if anything, biopsychosocial research has showed us is we need to be able to step outside of these nice, neat buckets of categorizing humans and trying to put them in a nice, neat bucket that they all respond to this specific treatment and honor and, and thrive in the uniqueness of that person and see if you can find a way to tailor yourself to them versus tailor them to this is the way we've always done it. And I think that's one of the things I know you and I've talked about, Zach, as far as like, well, how do we go beyond 
the the way that DPT school and and I don't this isn't a criticism harshly in DPTs because I think it's what we do it and definitely in, in medical schools and all these things where we we tend to have this way of we want to just bucket people into these nice neat uh, this is the diagnosis. This is a specific treatment. This is a specific that, you know, that biomedical model where, and then health is restored and life goes back. And we obviously see that chronic pain statistics would bear otherwise that we're not doing all that well there, but how, how do we go beyond just that nice, neat bucketing of, of, of people and, and helping students obviously know the buckets and be able to put them on boards and, and know some of the diagnostic reasoning and that normative reason that's very important part of what we do, but it doesn't give us that human humanity aspect of, well, how do I fit that to this unique person who's either crying in my room, angry, completely lost their life and identity, driven, a lot of things being driven more by, you know, things above the level of the tissues than getting too caught up in tissues. Where do you think we go? And maybe what are some of the strategies you're trying to employ there at your university to, to help students at least get an idea that they need to look bigger picture with some of their patients that they see in clinic? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Super fair criticism, Mark, especially kind of looking at those subcategorizations of patients. And yes, we, we have to have those for a lot of reasons. One, you've got to have a starting place. Mm -hmm. Two, you've got to be able to compare that to norms. And in a lot of our acute need and subacute, kind of that maybe even acute on chronic caseload, it works decently well. It gives you a place to start, gives you some things to look at and really start tweaking one or two variables at a time rather than approach it from this huge, overwhelming biopsychosocial approach. And we all know that you have to start somewhere. It's just when you look at, like you said, the chronic pain rates, that's when things start to fall off a little bit. And that's when really being able to tailor it to the person becomes so important. A part of that is being able to note those aberrations. And that's why I think, you know, recognizing that these buckets are there, but often those are starting points. So one of the ways that we've been looking at it in some of my courses is we look at the buckets and we say, what would this look like? We pick a patient and then I start giving some variables. So what happens if this doesn't work or we have to move into this next phase? What changes and why? So it's really asking the students to start assessing their own plan, their own progress and ask them to say, okay, if we look at this and this happens, why do we think that happened? Can we pinpoint it? And if not, what do we need to do differently? So it's asking to just be a lot more aware of the current situation um, maybe a starting place. Yeah. And I like it. I think, you know, you look at the treatment based classifications, if we just look at back pain and, you know, MDT, different ways of classifying people, they're not horrible thought process. I think, you know, obviously they haven't been shown to, to be this silver bullet, which, you know, that's probably never going to happen. Humans don't allow for silver bullets, uh, but it, it, they are good starting points, I think, but they have to be recognized that they aren't the solution. Now, the problem, and I've been one of these clinicians uh, where you feel like my way is the way, and that answers all the questions. Yet that approach is a quick path to burnout because you will see that people, despite your overwhelming belief in what you're doing, um, don't always fit that exact way of navigating it. So being a flexible clinician, being a intellectually humble clinician and being a, you know, ability to be critically appraising your practice continuously, whether you're 10 years out, 10 days out, or uh, 10 decades, and well, 10 decades, that would be a little bit long, but you know, you get the drift as far as, you know, you, you have to have that constant process. And I think that's what you see experts doing. And that's what we're all here to provide. You know, that's what we try to do at Modern Pain Gears, get folks on that path a lot more quickly than what you, myself, and Jared had to go through and navigating all these alphabet soup chases and all these different things where, um, you know, uh, I think could have saved a lot of time to where getting people on a good thinking process, reasoning process, but you bring up a lot of the good strategies that I love to hear what you guys are doing um, in your university. I think it is nice to introduce reasoning. Um, it, the tough thing is how do you, you know, examine reasoning <laughs> as far as it doesn't fit well on a Scantron. It doesn't, you know, there's not a real way to put um, you know, that on a, to truly objectify this intersubjective experience that, you know, you and I could treat the same patient and have slightly different reasonings based on my lived experience that I bring to the room. My context is different than the context you bring to the room. And it may equal two different interactions, yet two successful interactions because of that. So it's, I think if, when you start to look back at what clinical reasoning, critical thinking, and truly person-centered care is, it can look very different with clinicians who are doing it very successfully. Um, yet still you get in the same outcome yet. Um, 
So it's just, again, it, it escapes the subjective, uh, objectifying purpose or, or pursuit that we have in uh, education. And, and uh, you know, I don't know what the solution is that if you have one, I'd, I'd love to hear it, but that's a, that's a, that's a whole ball of wax there. Um, curious with like, you know, your use of like, uh, case studies or, or, you know, and, and there's, a, you know, other things, problem-based learning strategies and different things. We don't have to get too crazy into educational strategy, but I'm just curious, some other things that you think are helpful for, um, you know, be, again, be it the DPT student or be it the early career professional to help start to sharpen their skills in these uh, areas. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have, like I said, I don't have the answer by any means, Mark. Um, a lot of what I've been using problem-based management for is one, comparison, and two, mentored guidance. So in a lot of ways, I think that might be a start is to take these patients or these patient cases that we're using, allow students to work through them on their own and then provide our perspective. But the more perspectives we can provide on the same case, the more likely we are to see that the reasoning itself matters, how we approach it matters, but it may only matter in that interaction between ourselves and the person in front of us because the vast majority if we really look at what we're doing across the board I'd wager that we are almost all doing the exact same thing in different ways under different reasoning patterns and different reasoning methods and it's it's great because one yes there is a lot of diversity in the profession there's a lot of diversity in how educators teach and which camps we fall into whether we fall into you know MDT or Mulligan Maitland we're all probably doing very, very similar things. What tends to be the problem for me though, is when we get kind of pigeonholed into that one thing, like this is what you do for this. Um, but no, really like looking at cases is fantastic. I mean, yeah, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of it, but actually applying logic and science to the case themselves and showing how you can vary these principles and these things based on the data is huge for a lot of students because they start having these aha moments of, so I don't have to do it in this way. The book says I should do 15 sets or, you know, 10 sets of 15 throughout the day at this load and this percentage. Sure. That's an option, but it's helping people realize that there are all kinds of ways you can move laterally along that same spectrum to figure out what works best at that time for that patient. And that's a huge part of where case studies come in for me is just looking at it, providing some nudging and guidance, asking people to kind of just say, is this what I should be doing or not? Yeah. And why? Yeah, that's, that's a tough thing. And I remember this clearly when I was in DPT school, we had a professor who, uh, you know, tried to, and did uh, instituted problem-based learning, which is a lot of like, you're, you're presented a problem and you have to kind of go out and find your information and, and think through it and kind of reason through it. And man, it was a rebellion in our DPT class, I remember, because we weren't getting the answers. We wanted to just lay it on a PowerPoint, put it in the bullet points. I want to get the exam. And then it was just such a different, but man, does that so much more replicate what you do in the clinic? Because guess what? You ain't going to have a PowerPoint that fits a good chunk of patients you see. So if you want to get good at, you know, ingesting PowerPoints and regurgitating them on exams, great. That is not going to translate well to the clinic. It just isn't. I mean, it, it's good to have that knowledge to be able to call upon some of these diagnostic clusters and different things when we're doing some of that normative reasoning. But when we see a lot of these patients that don't perfectly fit any of these categorical ways that the PowerPoints try to bucket people into, again, for good reason. And it, it gives us a great starting point, like Zach said. Um, but hey, man, it, it, there's just so much more to clinical life than that. And if we can just recognize that and then embrace it and then be able to be this flexible, you know, clinician, both flexible with our thought process, flexible with how we interact with a person to, to really honor that expertise that's in the room of, alongside us that I think too often, especially when you're early career and you're definitely when you're a DPA student, you're like, so in your own head that it's hard to see that, Hey, there's another human on the other side of this interaction that I need to really elicit their perspective and bring their context in the room and be more purposeful with that. That's a tough transition for a lot of students. That's a lot of multitasking cognitively that takes some reps to get into to where you can do that. What are your um, thoughts on, uh, you know, and we talked a little bit about it, but mentorship uh, as far as, and maybe mentorship, what are some of the good and bad parts of it that, you know, that students might encounter 
in clinical rotations and maybe early in their careers. Cause I, you know, I wasn't always the best mentor looking back. I was kind of trying to pigeonhole people just in exactly what you said, the one way to do it um, because that was just my comfort zone and security blanket way as a clinician to operate. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, on, on mentorship. I mean, we're not here to tear down anybody, which I know you and I don't, but some people get all, you know, we all get defensive when, you know, mentorship gets questioned, especially if it's our mentorship. But as you can see, I think we were all reflective on past opportunities to mentor and things we could have did better in the past. But curious what you think on mentorship, how that operates under DPT education and then early career education and how that can be maybe there's the good and bad parts of that. Um, obviously, it's a big question, but maybe with some of the things you see. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a huge question, Mark. And I think it's really one of those that needs to be asked more often and what it means. One, we can look at it from the employer perspective where, you know, how many employers are you aware of that offer mentorship upon graduation? I mean, right now there's a ton, but it's defining what that mentorship means, both from a perspective of clinic, but also from the perspective of the person. And I think a lot of people, when they get into these mentorship experiences, they really aren't ready for what it means, what it's going to ask of them. And there's not a good communication between one, the mentor and the mentee, also that clear role delineation of here's what I should be doing as a mentee and here's what I should be asking of my mentor. And it's, it becomes this transactional thing that's not necessarily what really we run into in true mentorship, which is where we come across these people that we, you know, that inspire us that we want to learn from. In fact, that's kind of what you see with a lot of social media. I think it's, it's a one-way mentorship. It's, this is what this person's doing and I love the way they do it. I'm going to try to emulate that. Um, so it's just, it's one of those really hard things to talk about right now because it's so varied and what it means is so different from person to person. What you get from it is going to strongly depend on your relationship with that person, how open both of you are to shifting your perspective, shifting your teaching and learning styles to really maximize the benefit of it. So it, it's a hard question. It's a hard scenario to get into. It is, it is. I, and I don't think there's and and you and I and, and Jared put a lot of thought into this. And I know you and I actually, after this podcast, we'll be chatting about how do we structure our mentorship to honor what you just said is like, you know, different people. Can we set it up to where we're, here's the clear expectations of how we expect you to be intellectually humble, open to criticism, open to give criticism, open to receive criticism. Um, how do we, you know, create mentorship scenarios where we have students and, and clinicians who are just really maximizing their potential through it and and tailoring that just like we do the n equals one with our patients we should be doing the n equals one with our clinicians who are trying to teach and it being a you know a, 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 a not just a you know you know you know what transactional the one-sided way of i'm going to just emulate what i see it's just how do you as a mentor to recognize the strengths of your mentee and tailor an experience mm -hmm. that capitalizes on their strengths definitely identify their weaknesses but um, you know, Zach Huff brings different context and skills and thought processes. Maybe, uh, you know, Mark does MDT. Zach maybe doesn't do much MDT. Well, it doesn't, honestly, and that's where I think sometimes we get so hung up, like you should be doing it my way, um, which I don't think, you know, but there's definitely things that I think mentors can help with like pattern recognition that may respond to one thing, but honoring that different experiences are in the room um, in a mentorship situation and allowing, you know, students to kind of come into their own clinicians to come in their own versus becoming a clone of the mentor, uh, which I think, you know, definitely good things to emulate from mentors, but I think um, we're all going to be different. And I think we need to honor that uniqueness that we're trying to honor with our patients as we do with our mentees as, as well. And I think giving people the skills to think and to reason and to, to just, man, I wish I would have had those early in my career because I would have accelerated my growth exponentially versus chasing letters and techniques and with all without any real good thinking and reasoning process to, to guide, guide the way. Cause it's that thinking and reasoning process probably would have saved me a lot of time and money um, of, of things that I thought I needed to, to fix people and all these things. But um, curious, uh, you know, and we've talked about this a little bit and uh, you know, the virtual mentorship thing in the presence of COVID um, you know, especially, I think it's, it, and the, the, you and I are going to uh, talk about how do we 
you know, really structure these experiences because we've definitely had learners and clinicians in our programs who really enjoyed the virtual mentorship and, and different things. And we've got some cool things on the pipe that we'll definitely let you all know about. But what are your thoughts on, you know, where things can go in a virtual setting? Obviously, this might be beyond DPT education, but um, we're trying to reach out to our young DPT students and, and hopefully position them to to seek out some opportunities, um, whether it be with modern pain care or residencies or fellowships or any situation that can help them grow and improve. We're, we're 100% on board with it. So curious what your thoughts are on, on the opportunities that like the virtual format provides that, you know, we may not have had in, in traditional mentoring opportunities. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, when we look at our traditional mentoring, it's how often can you physically be in the presence of your mentor or mentee? And that to a large degree has likely hamstrung the total experiences we have as clinicians because it relies on one, your ability to travel. We know that if you don't have PTO or you don't have, um, if you have a family even, it makes it really hard to get out of your state. In fact, that's been one of my issues is getting out of the state is I've still got mentorship hours for my fellowship to knock out. And it's getting to those that are really good is hard to do. And I've found a couple in you know my area that finally kind of I've connected with, but it took a lot of doing. So having a virtual mentorship opens tons of opportunities for these people that you want to connect with. In fact, if we look at a lot of people on social media right now, those that you want to emulate, odds are you have an opportunity to connect with them in some meaningful way. What matters is how you make that connection intentional and how you make that connection work for you and help you gain what you want from it. And that's where I think that the big challenge is, is knowing what they offer, what people are able to get from that is the tough part. But what it's done is it really has opened up so many doors to connection, to communication, to where we don't have to sit face to face. Does it help? Yeah. It's nice to see body language. It's nice to see things, but it's not necessary. It's yeah. given me opportunities to figure out. I've got mentors um, that I connect with out of Indiana. I've got one or two that I connect with in Texas and it's all done virtually. And it's all been huge for my progress as a academic kind of newbie, but also as an experienced clinician. I mean, I've gotten so many more connections since COVID hit just because I had to out of necessity mm -hmm. and they had to do the same because that's the way they're connecting now. So I think virtual mentorships really are a huge, huge area for one growth and two, just broad experiences. And I mean, you look at the data, there's not a lot on it, but they have looked at some of this data for medical students and uh, medical internships. And they found that virtual mentorship has the same impact on progression as in person in a lot of instances. Now they've even looked at it from a surgeon's perspective. Now I, I needed to look more into those studies, but there are a lot of opportunities for virtual mentorships to fill in some of these gaps that we're running into. That yeah. way you're not stuck with what you have you can actually explore what you find important and meaningful and give you some opportunities there yeah too often i you know we get conversations with clinicians who come to us saying you know i'm on an island you know i hear what social media is telling me i need to be doing but then i'm looking around to my colleagues here and you know they're kind of practicing a little bit you know old school traditional you know and maybe not as, as up to date that i want to you know excel at and grow and i feel like my growth's limited in this island situation and in so it's it's been one of the nice uh, you know pleasant you know surprises i guess i'd say is we've had folks come into our programs to see like folks feel like man i got a community of like-minded clinicians around me who are thinking like me and i i can't have these clinic these conversations in clinic but man i can jump on my smartphone i can you know jump on a zoom call you know a couple times a week and i can really get some some solid guidance from fellow clinicians in my in my similar situation but also from obviously mentors jared myself yourself um to help folks grow and to help folks kind of get that and uh the the interesting thing i you know and i know there's, and I probably would have been this clinician where it's like, man, I'm not, what if I'm not learning techniques and actually we're going to incorporate, you know, some live and some, uh, you know, components of our, our mentorship where we'll have maybe some technical instruction, but more it's going to be, let's get some real patience in the door and start applying what we talk about and not just, you know, hero posts on social media and now, you know, all these amazing things. Cause that's to me where you can see your mentors, you know, apply it and learn from it and see what their thinking and reasoning is, have them kind of reflect real time with patients. And that's stuff we're building into our program with some of the live stream capacities we'll have. Um, and then I'll see live courses we'll have 
one thing I've respected out of like MDT and different things is they bring live patients in and they apply the thinking to it. Don't always hundred percent agree with MDT uh, nor Maitland nor most, you know, systems that are, and I wouldn't say they're stringent, but you know, there's weaknesses of everything, but it, and I think being open to it, not being the end all be all any one system. Um, again, humans probably going to fit in any neat bucket like that, but yeah, I think there are some exciting opportunities. And if it's something that sounds like it's of interest to you as you're listening to this podcast, you'd like to, you know, you're thinking, man, I, you know, I, I want to get into a, a community of some like-minded clinicians who are thinking this way. Maybe you're, you're feeling like you're on that. Island. Maybe you're feeling like, man, I just feel like I'm just getting stagnant and I'm in an early career. Um, we've had some clinicians who are like, man, I started my own clinic, started my own business, but now I'm on my, I am on an island because there ain't anybody around me. So I need um, I've been doing good on the business coaching aspect, but I need somebody on the, on the clinical uh, coaching aspect. So if that's of interest, you don't hesitate to reach out to, you know, us via social media message, modern pain care, or uh, reach out to Jared or myself. We've been kind of quarterback and that Zach's going to be helping us um, as we kind of design curriculum. That's going to meet the needs of today's learner. And most importantly, help you guys in the clinic and, and grow any, uh, that was me rambling as per usual, Zach, but I'm just curious if you have any other um, thoughts or, or, or things you want to leave folks with before we wrap up today's episode. No, no, no. Uh, ramble on, Mark. As usual, your ramblings are educative and uh, super helpful, man. Um, really, if we're going to look at kind of that last bit, like what can I talk about that I think matters is being very intentional in your mentorship opportunities. So seeking out people that you want to learn from and recognizing that everyone has these strengths that you can learn from in that aspect. Like Mark said, if you want to learn MDT, don't come to me. You may want to go to Mark instead. But it's not just about clinical stuff. A lot of time when you start getting these mentors, they can lead you towards other people who can help guide you in business development. They can put you in connection with um, the people that they know who have been successful in certain ways and certain aspects. So connecting with mentors in some area is going to open doors to other mentors. And in fact, you're going to have some that are for your clinical life, for your personal life, for your financial life. Those different mentors are going to be off, able to offer different things. So when you're looking for it, know what you want and really be willing to ask the questions that get you from A to B. Yeah, well put. So recognizing that, I think what we've pointed out is that DBT school probably going to be a little bit limited in the ability to get you to where you're a, a top-notch critical thinker and clinical reasoner. And hence why mentorship and, and pursuing these type of opportunities to fill those holes, um, which is again, why we've created our programming here at Modern Pain Care is we recognize not everybody's going to do residency and fellowship, just ain't going to be in the cards. And, you know, Zach mentioned some of the challenges of finding mentors and different things when you have to go travel and have somebody be physically with you. The, the virtual opportunities really open up a lot of doors um, for us to deliver some high level stuff and uh, most importantly, get some results for the clinicians who are who are thirsty and hungry to, to be better than the status quo or the, you know, the, you know, general average clinician. So I'm going to leave it at that today. Hopefully you guys found some value in this. Like I said, if you have any questions or concerns or things that you would like to hear us talk about on the podcast, don't hesitate to reach out via social media, Mark at modernpaincare.com or Jared at modernpaincare.com. We're happy to hear any thoughts or questions you may have or ideas for topics um, that you'd like to hear us talk about in the future. But until then I will leave it at that and you guys have a great rest of your day.